Girls, how is everybody today? Good. Today, we are going to learn about the Presidency of the United States of America. We are going to review facts about the office itself and about those men who have been elected President of the United States. Okay, boys and girls, now let's begin. Throughout the history of the world, there has never been an elected office to compare with the Presidency of the United States. Against a backdrop of tyranny in a world that was ruled by monarchs, the framers of the Constitution gave us and our country the office of the President in 1789. Combining the dignity of a king with the power of a prime minister, the President is the highest elected official in the U.S. The demands of the office are great. The President must act as the chief diplomat directing the nation's foreign policies, as the commander-in-chief directing all of the country's armed forces, as the chief of state, the ceremonial head of our government, and the chief executive directing the day-to-day -day operations of the executive branch of government. As the highest officer elected by all of the people, he is the leader of the free world. Many men have aspired to the office of the president, but only 40 men have ever been elected president of the United States. Only one has ever resigned, and four presidents have paid for the honor with their lives. We will review each of the men who have held the office of the president. We will learn what they look like. We will monitor the growth of our nation under each man's administration. And we will learn a little history about each one as well as we study their careers and their lives. Remember, if you ever need more time to look at something, you can just stop the tape with your VCR's pause button and study the information a little longer. As we begin our review of the presidents, you will see some numbers next to their portraits. Mark them down. This is how our interactive video system, IVS, works. They will match the numbers on your VCR's tape meter and act as a road map so you will always know where you are. You will be able to fast forward or rewind anytime you like and review your favorite presidents. Now let's have some fun. How many presidents can you name? Do you know who was the first president? How about the third? Or the eighth? Which president spent the shortest time in office? Which president had the longest term in office? We will learn so much together as we learn to know the presidents of the United States. George Washington, 
the first president and father of our country, served from 1790 to 1797. George Washington's vice president was John Adams. President Washington said in his address to the Constitutional Convention, Let us raise a standard to which the wise and honest can repair. The rest is in the hands of God. John Adams, the second president served from 1797 to 1801. John Adams, vice president, was Thomas Jefferson. President Adams is quoted from his dissertation on the canon and feudal law. Liberty cannot be preserved without a general knowledge among the people. Thomas Jefferson. The third president served from 1801 to 1809. Thomas Jefferson's vice presidents were Aaron Burr and George Clinton. President Jefferson wrote as he drafted the Declaration of Independence. We call upon the protection of divine providence and pledge to one another ourselves, our fortunes, and our most sacred honor. James Madison, our fourth president, served from 1809 to 1817. James Madison's vice presidents were George Clinton and Elbridge Jerry. President Madison wrote in The Federalist, The public good, the real welfare of the great body of the people, is the supreme object to be pursued. James Monroe, our fifth president, served from 1817 to 1825. James Monroe's vice president was Daniel Tompkins. President Monroe is quoted from the Monroe Doctrine. The American continents are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. John Quincy Adams, sixth president of the United States, served from 1825 to 1829. John Adams' vice president was John Calhoun. President Adams delivered this message to Congress. The great object of the institution of civil government is the improvement of the condition of those who are party to the social compact. Andrew Jackson, the seventh president served from 1829 to 1837. Andrew Jackson's vice presidents were John Calhoun and Martin Van Buren. President Jackson wrote in his veto of the bank renewal bill, There are no necessary evils in government. Its evils exist only in its abuses. If it would confine itself to equal protection, and, as heaven does its rains, shower its favors alike on the high and the low, the rich and the poor, it would be an unqualified blessing. Martin Van Buren, the eighth president, served from 1837 to 1841. Martin Van Buren's vice president was Richard Johnson. President Van Buren said in his inaugural address, From a small community, we have risen to a people powerful in numbers and strength. But with our increase has gone hand in hand the progress of just principles. William H. Harrison, the ninth president, was elected in 1841. William Harrison's vice president was John Tyler. President Harrison is quoted from his inaugural address. The only legitimate right to govern is an express grant of power from the governed. 
President Harrison passed away after only one month in office. John Tyler, our 10th president, served from 1841 to 1845. John Tyler assumed the presidency after the death of William H. Harrison. President Tyler stated in his inaugural address, The institutions under which we live, my countrymen, secure each person in the perfect enjoyment of all his rights. James K. Polk, our 11th president served from 1845 to 1849. Polk's vice president was George Dallas. President Polk delivered this message to Congress. We must ever maintain the principle that the people of this continent alone have the right to decide their own destiny. Zachary Taylor, the 12th president of the United States served from 1849 to 1850. President Taylor said in his message to Congress, For more than half a century, this union has stood unshaken. Whatever dangers may threaten it, I shall stand by it and maintain it in its integrity to the full extent of the obligations imposed and the powers conferred upon me by the Constitution. Millard Fillmore, the 13th president served from 1850 to 1853. President Fillmore is quoted in his message to Congress. I think no event would be hailed with more gratification by the people of the United States than the amicable adjustment of questions of difficulty which have now for a long time agitated this country. Franklin Pierce, the 14th president served from 1853 to 1857. Franklin Pierce's vice president was William King. President Pierce stated in his inaugural address, In expressing briefly my views upon an important subject which has recently agitated the nation, I fervently hope that the question is at rest and that no sectional or ambitious or fanatical excitement may again threaten the durability of our institutions. James Buchanan, our 15th president served from 1857 to 1861. James Buchanan's vice president was John Breckinridge. President Buchanan delivered this message to Congress. Our union rests upon public opinion and can never be cemented by the blood of its citizens shed in a civil war. Abraham Lincoln, the 16th President of the United States, served from 1861 to 1865. Abraham Lincoln's vice presidents were Hannibal Hamlin and Andrew Johnson. President Lincoln said in his inaugural address, Why should there not be a patient confidence in the ultimate justice of the people? Is there any better or equal hope in the world? President Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth while watching a play at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. Andrew Johnson, our 17th president, served from 1865 to 1869. Andrew Johnson assumed the presidency after the death of Abraham Lincoln. President Johnson is quoted in his message to Congress, it is our sacred duty to transmit unimpaired to our posterity the blessings of liberty which were bequeathed to us by the founders of the Republic. Ulysses S. Grant, the 18th president, served from 1869 to 1877. Ulysses S. Grant's vice presidents were Schuler Colfax and Henry Wilson. President Grant stated in his inaugural address, I ask patient forbearance one toward another throughout the land and a determined effort on the part of every citizen to do his share toward cementing a happy union. Rutherford B. Hayes, 
19th President of the United States served from 1877 to 1881. Rutherford Hayes Vice President was William Wheeler. President Hayes said in his inaugural address, He serves his party best who serves his country best. James A. Garfield, the 20th president, was elected in 1881. James Garfield's vice president was Chester Arthur. President Garfield wrote in his acceptance of the presidential nomination. Next in importance to freedom and justice is popular education, without which neither freedom nor justice can be permanently maintained. President Garfield was in office less than four months when he was fatally shot in a Washington Depot. Chester A. Arthur, the 21st president served from 1881 to 1885. Chester Arthur assumed the presidency after the death of James Garfield. President Arthur delivered this inaugural address. No higher or more assuring proof could exist of the strength and permanence of popular government than the fact that though the chosen of the people be struck down, his constitutional successor is peacefully installed without shock or strain. Grover Cleveland, our 22nd and 24th presidents, served between 1885 and 1897. Grover Cleveland's vice presidents were Thomas Hendricks and Adlai Stevenson. President Cleveland stated in his inaugural address, Your every voter, as surely as your chief magistrate, exercises a public trust. Benjamin Harrison, 23rd President of the United States, served from 1889 to 1893. Benjamin Harrison's vice president was Levi Morton. President Harrison said in his inaugural address, Let those who would die for the flag on the field of battle give a better proof of their patriotism and a higher glory to their country by promoting fraternity and justice. William McKinley, the 25th president, served from 1897 to 1901. William McKinley's vice presidents were Garrett Hobart and Theodore Roosevelt. President McKinley is quoted in his inaugural address. We want no war of conquest. War should never be entered upon until every agency of peace has failed. President McKinley was fatally shot by an anarchist six months after his re-election in Buffalo, New York. Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th president, served from 1901 to 1909. Theodore Roosevelt assumed the presidency after the death of William McKinley. Theodore Roosevelt's vice president was Charles Fairbanks. President Roosevelt wrote in Builders of the State, it is well indeed for our land that we of this generation have learned to think nationally. William H. Taft, our 27th president, served from 1909 to 1913. William Taft's vice president was James Sherman. President Taft stated in his veto of the Arizona Enabling Act, a government is for the benefit of all of the people. Woodrow Wilson, our 28th president, served from 1913 to 1921. Woodrow Wilson's vice president was Thomas Marshall. President Wilson spoke in his address to the Senate. There must not be a balance of power, but a community of power not organized rivalries, but an organized and common peace. Warren G. Harding, 29th President of the United States, served from 1921 to 1923. Warren Harding's Vice President was Calvin Coolidge.
President Harding delivered his address to Congress. We mean to have less government in business and more business in government. Calvin Coolidge, the 30th president served from 1923 to 1929. Calvin Coolidge's vice president was Charles Dawes. President Coolidge said in his inaugural address, Economy is idealism in its most practical form. Herbert Hoover, our 31st president, served from 1929 to 1933. Herbert Hoover's vice president was Charles Curtis. President Hoover wrote in Rugged Individualism, The greatness of America has grown out of a political and social system and a method of control of economic forces distinctly its own, our American system. Franklin D. Roosevelt, our 32nd president, served from 1933 to 1945. Franklin Roosevelt's vice presidents were John Garner, Henry Wallace, and Harry Truman. President Roosevelt stated in his Four Freedoms Address, The world order which we seek is the cooperation of free countries, working together in a friendly, civilized society. Harry S. Truman, 33rd President of the United States, served from 1945 to 1953. Harry Truman's vice president was Albin Barkley. President Truman delivered this address to Congress. The responsibility of the great states is to serve and not to dominate the world. Dwight D. Eisenhower, the 34th president, served from 1953 to 1961. Dwight Eisenhower's vice president was Richard Nixon. President Eisenhower addressed the Geneva Conference. The quest for peace is the statesman's most exacting duty. Practical progress to lasting peace is his fondest hope. John F. Kennedy, our 35th president, served from 1961 to 1963. John Kennedy's vice president was Lyndon Johnson. President Kennedy spoke in his inaugural address. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. President Kennedy was assassinated while riding in a motorcade as he was visiting Dallas, Texas on November 22, 1963. Lyndon B. Johnson, the 36th president served from 1963 to 1969. Lyndon Johnson assumed the presidency after the death of John F. Kennedy. Lyndon Johnson's vice president was Hubert Humphrey. President Johnson said in his inaugural address, If we fail now, then we will have forgotten in abundance what we learned in hardship, that democracy rests on faith, freedom asks more than it gives, and the judgment of God is harshest on those who are most favored. Richard M. Nixon, the 37th president, served from 1969 to 1974. Richard Nixon's vice president was Spiro Agnew. President Nixon is quoted in his inaugural address. The peace that we seek to win is not victory over any other people, but the peace that comes with healing in its wings. Under the threat of impeachment following the Watergate break-ins, Nixon was the first president in history to resign his office. Gerald R. Ford, our 38th president, served from 1974 to 1977. President Ford became America's first unelected president by assuming office when Richard Nixon resigned. President Ford stated in his inaugural address, My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. Our Constitution works. Our great republic is a government of laws and not of men. Here the people rule. James E. Carter, 39th President of the United States, served from 1977 to 1981.
James Carter's vice president was Walter Mondale. President Carter delivered this inaugural address. Two centuries ago, our nation's birth was a milestone in the long quest for freedom. But the bold and brilliant dream which excited the founders of our nation still awaits its consummation. Ronald W. Reagan, our 40th president served from 1981 to 1989. Ronald Reagan's vice president was George Bush. President Reagan spoke in his inaugural address. With all the creative energy at our command, let us begin an era of national renewal. Let us renew our determination, our courage, and our strength. We have every right to dream heroic dreams. George Bush, the 41st president, was elected in 1989. George Bush's vice president was Dan Quayle. President Bush is quoted in his inaugural address. America is never wholly herself unless she's engaged in high moral principle. We as a people have such a purpose today. It is to make kinder the face of the nation and gentler the face of the world. Thank you.